I suspect if I were to ask the question tonight, most of you would be able to answer it. And that question is, do you remember the first moon landing, the first man on the moon? Do you remember where you were and who you were with? I apologise to those that are too young to remember that. I think Vivi will probably... I'm not going to get myself, get myself into trouble. No, going, not going down there. I was only young myself, but I do remember my brother and I were allowed to stay up and we were wrapped in, uh, in quilts and sat on the sofa and watched that historic event. And we heard Neil Armstrong say those words, one small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. Now, you must have heard that. Good. Okay. That's become quite a famous statement, hasn't it? But an incredibly profound statement. I wish I'd thought of it, <laughs> to be honest, because it just says everything. And to be honest, in that particular few moments, Neil Armstrong did only do a small step. Compared to everything that he'd done previously in getting to the moon, all he actually did was climb down the ladder, leap around a little bit on the moon's surface, play some golf or imaginary golf, and stick a flag in the ground. And then he was back up the ladder again, back into the space shuttle. So what he actually did wasn't that incredible. It wasn't, I was going to say rocket science, but that's a bit of a pun, isn't it? <laughs> but it wasn't, that, it wasn't that difficult for him to do that. But that particular step was, in fact, a giant leap for mankind. It had profound effects on the world and for mankind. What an historic event for that to have achieved, for, to achieve that. And in a way, we could say that Abraham had one of those moments in our, in our reading. Because Abraham actually only did something very, very simple. All that Abraham did was offer hospitality to three strangers. But it was the fact that he did offer hospitality to those three strangers and who those three strangers were that had a profound effect on his life, and the life of his family, and the life of the Jewish nation and of the world to come. Because Abraham at this point, was on a journey. He was on a journey sent by God to go to the promised land. He hadn't a clue where he was going. He hadn't a clue why he was going. And the big thing that troubled him the most was that God had said to him, he was going to be father to the nations. His heirs were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he was thinking to himself, God, there's one slight flaw in this statement. I don't have any children. And Sarah, my wife, is way past childbearing age. But the faith of Abraham kept him going. He knew he had to be obedient to God. And somehow, it was all going to fit together. But he hadn't a clue how it was going to happen. And that's why in that Hebrew statement, that Hebrew passage that we read out of Hebrews, it was a fantastic, because he says, by faith, Abraham. It was by faith that Abraham kept going. By faith in God. Blind faith, because he could not see what God was doing. He could not understand what God was doing. So he'd come to this point where he was resting in the midday sun, and he was actually a migrant. He was a wanderer. He was walking, doing this journey, going from place to place, setting up his tent. So he wasn't in a particularly stable position himself. He probably didn't have very much food. He probably was tired. He probably was, was just a little frustrated. He might have been sat there outside of his tent thinking, Lord, why are you doing this to me? So when he saw these three strangers coming over the hill, I think he could have been forgiven to thinking, oh no, oh dear, <laughs> have we got enough food, Sarah? We're going to have to offer these men hospitality. Now, the fact that these three men uh, were important men 
and Abraham recognise them is, is a bit of a debate. Okay, some people say Abraham knew that they were the Lord, that this was the Lord, because he knelt down and he worshipped them. Some people say, well, no, he didn't know. Some people say that these three men were the Lord, all three of them. Some say that it was the Lord and two angels. And another interpretation is that it was actually God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost. In other words, a, 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 a trinity sort of um, idea. But whatever it was, Abraham offered them hospitality. And hospitality in Abraham's day and in that Eastern culture is always the very best. You don't just look in the cupboard and think, well, we can make do, just stick a bit more meat in, we'll be all right. It was to go out, get the fatted calf, kill it and offer the very best. As I say, Abraham and Sarah at that point were living in tents. They had very little, but they gave all they had. And Abraham recognised those as important people. He didn't know who they were. He didn't know their names. Did they have any names if they were angels? We don't know. But Abraham recognised that this was a moment to offer hospitality and to offer the finest hospitality to these men. And these men were, indeed, angels, God, we don't know. But these men were part of this plan that God had for Abraham. These men sat down and had fellowship with Abraham and called Sarah into the, into the fellowship as well. They prophesied that this time next year, Sarah, you will have a child. Sarah didn't believe them. They, she laughed. She got into trouble for that. I have every sympathy for Sarah. I probably would have fainted. Never mind, laugh. But they were part of this great plan that God had. They also went on, if you read later on, to, to say that Sodom and Gomorrah, who were in, in dreadful sin and, and uh, debauchery was going on in these, these cities, were going to be destroyed, that God could no longer tolerate their behavior. And Abraham was given a chance to plead with God for those who were righteous in those cities, a chance for them to escape, including his own nephew, Lot. God was meeting with Abraham because Abraham offered hospitality. Abraham gave the very best to strangers. He reached out to them and said, brothers, you're welcome in our house. Now, those of you who know that today we are launching this series on migration, we might be thinking to yourselves, well, what has this got to do with being a, 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 a migration, with being a refugee, being an asylum seeker? Well, it plays an important part because hospitality is an important key here. One of the issues that we're facing at the moment, as we know, we see the news and we see these desperate people is the way these desperate people are being treated. The way these desperate people are being looked upon as troublemakers. We don't want you in our country. We can't cope with you in our country. Go away, go somewhere else. You're not needed here. And that is so counter what God tells us to be. We read countless times in the Bible about how we have to offer hospitality, how we have to reach out to the homeless, to the stranger, to the poor, to the oppressed. God never held back his blessing on anyone. And we as his children and as his church must do the same. Hospitality is the absolute key. Hospitality is, is about welcoming someone in. It's about giving them space to be themselves. It's about not judging them. It's about meeting their needs. Can we honestly say we're doing that now to those people who are fleeing to those people who are living rough on the sides of the streets in Greece and in Turkey and all the other places where they're trying to find a rest. 
Hospitality is about reaching out and giving the very best, not just tolerating. I work at the moment with a student who's on placement with us. She's from Bradford University, but she's Greek, and her home is Lesbos. And I was asking her the other day what it's like in Lesbos at the moment, and she says, well, the Greeks are not going out. They're not going out in the streets because they're so tired of the people that are there, of all these people sleeping in the streets. And I, I have a little bit of sympathy there, but I just think, well, why, why can't you bring them in? Why can't you do something? Why can't you reach out to them? Why can't you offer them hospitality? Abraham offered hospitality, and he entertained the Lord. Do we know who these people are? Or do we just look at them and see the sea of people on our television screens? And do we think, like a lot of people are thinking, we can't cope with these people. We don't want them in our country. Instead of taking the emphasis off us, saying we can't cope, what we should be asking is, how can they cope? How can they cope having to give up everything in their homeland and start fleeing away and running away, trying desperately to find somewhere that's, somewhere that's peace, somewhere that's going to offer them hospitality, somewhere where they can live and bring up their children in security. I, I've been um, guilty as everybody else of, of thinking this and asking these questions. And then I realized when I was watching one of the news reports that actually I was just looking at them as a crowd. I was just looking at them as this crowd of people. Instead of thinking that this crowd is made up of individuals. This crowd is made up of doctors, of architects, of solicitors, of teachers, people of high standing, plus poor people as well. And they are finding no welcome anywhere. They all have stories to tell. They all have horrific stories to tell. But we're not listening to them. We're just herding them together and looking at them en masse. Now, you might say to yourself, well, what can I do? What can we do? What can other countries do? There's just too many. Well, even if we just reach out to one person, we're actually showing the love of God to that person. I was really quite touched when I heard one of the news reports that um, a private school, I think it's somewhere near Harrogate, called St. Ethelberger's, um, have actually opened up eight places for Syrian orphans to go and board with them and get an education. Eight children. Now you might think, well, that's not many in the grand scheme of things. But imagine those eight children, the ed they're getting an education. What they can do with that education. And I just think, well, God bless them for doing that. And we could all do something even if it's only small, we could all do something and reach out to these people. And, even, and I say even if, I don't really mean even if, even if we continue to pray, even if we continue to reach out to them with love and compassion, even if we support the organisations that are trying to help them and do all we can to offer hospitality, then we're doing as the Lord requires God, as we heard this morning, is a God on the move. He is with people who are on migration journeys. He is with the refugees. He was with Abraham as they moved from town to town. He was with Moses as they went through the wilderness. He is with these people. And we saw, didn't we, a few weeks ago, those of you who watched that Songs of Praise, that church in Calais, and uh, they've built in the middle of this jungle, as they call it, this church. It's important to them to worship God. It's the first thing they did. These people are not scroungers. They're not people who deserve our annoyance and our anger and our hatred. 
They're people who we need to reach out to. After the Second World War, Israel was so impressed by the way non-Jews put their lives at risk to get Jewish people out of the ghettos and out of the countries and out of, uh, into safety, that they gave them all an honour called Righteous Among the Nations. And I just think, what a lovely title, Righteous Among the Nations. And I think that that is what God is calling us to be, righteous among the nations. We can help these people by changing our attitudes and our hearts. We can look out for opportunities to bless. We can look out to pray for them. And we can seek God's heart for these people. It is only by a a circumstance that it's not us. We've been born in a country that at the moment is not at war. We don't have to flee our houses. 20 years ago, these people were probably thinking the same thing. Now, suddenly, they've had to, the whole world has collapsed. Our world could collapse. It isn't that they've done something wrong. It's just they happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the summer, I was... um, I was in Sussex and I went to a, a presentation which was given by uh, people who were been in the detention centre at Gatwick Airport. Asylum seekers had written their stories. And unfortunately, the detention centre at Gatwick Airport has been uh, the source of a lot of criticism for ill treatment. And basically, people who have been arrested coming into Gatwick as asylum seekers have been actually put in detention and treated like criminals. And I was very touched to hear a story by a man who said, I've been to England before. I was a doctor. I came to a medical convention. I was given the very best treatment. And now I am being treated like a criminal. What have I done to deserve this? And it made me think. It made me think. And it made me realize that these are individuals and that we need to reach out to them. So let's think about ways that we can help. Let's think about what can I do? What can I do? I'm sure the staff at St. Ethelberg has thought exactly the same thing. What can we do? Well, we can offer eight children, orphan children, an education and a chance in life. The Christian author called Edie Wadsworth has written a book called 31 Days to a Heart of Hospitality. And she says this, you're busy, you don't have the skill set. Their problems are too much. Their life is a mess. Your life is a mess. You're too impatient. You're not kind enough. You don't even like them. You have nothing to offer. What does it really matter? Turns out, in the end, it's all that really matters. I'd like to suggest that today we become righteous among the nations. That we do, ne- we never say, does it really matter? that we never say there's nothing I have to offer, that we never say we don't like these people. They are children of God. They are loved by God. And we are their brothers and sisters. Amen.